Welcome everyone to this special uh, update on the Montgomery Fund. My name is Scott Phillips, the Head of Distribution here at Montgomery and I have with us today Portfolio Manager for the Montgomery Fund, uh, Joseph Kim. Welcome. Okay, so it seems a lifetime ago but uh, calendar year 2021 was a great year for equities both locally and globally. But uh, as we record this on the 10th of March 2022, we look at the past sort of nine weeks and so much has happened in the world. We've seen equities uh, sharply lower both domestically and globally. We've seen concerns around inflation and interest rates therefore. We've seen a war erupt in the Ukraine. Uh, supply constraints come through to some precious materials, uh, both commodities on the soft side and the hard side and stratospheric prices as a result. All of this has meant there's been huge amounts of volatility and, and understandably uncertainty for investors. So I'm going to take this moment to talk to Joe and, and try and unravel a bit about what's going on in the Montgomery Fund. Um, and first thing I'd like to do, Joe, is calendar year 2021 was a good year for the Montgomery Fund. Uh, the fund outperformed strongly over the broader market. Maybe just take us through the drivers of that and how you saw uh, the fund being positioned and, and playing out. Well, Scott, if you look at uh, the Montgomery Fund's returns over 2021, the drivers of those returns are very broad. And if you look at the slide, you can see the sector contributions. You can see there's not any one sector that dominates the return profile. We had, a, we had our quality companies deliver very good earnings growth. So if you look at in the likes of you know, Reliance, Goodman, Centuria, all across the spectrum. We also had some very good turnaround stories from Telstra. Uh, we had very good growth from Unity. Um, and then we also had a whole host of uh, reopening plays, which you know, last year as sort of the outlook for COVID improved for most of the year. We had companies like IDP, very well managed during the downturn. Um, and we also had um, Centre Group, you know, as, as a reopening in sort of broader Australia occurred in. And finally, on Sydney Airport, we had the takeover offer, which um, really highlighted the value of the infrastructure asset. So you, there's not any one thematic that um, really underpinned the returns for the Montgomery Fund, and that's what we expect going forward. Okay, so the portfolio has uh, a definitely a quality bias across uh, all of the names. Um, as we look into calendar year 2022, uh, the picture has been very different for the, for, I will say, the price performance of these businesses, um, let alone the difference between the operating performance, which I know out the back of reporting season has been strong. So can you just take me through what's gone on in calendar year 2022 so far and therefore why is the Montgomery Fund you know, trailing the broader market? So I think if you look at uh, 2022 in general, um, so we entered a reporting season much more cautious than we were last year and there's a combination of factors um, on that. So we, we know that there is uh, inflationary forces that are spiking. We also know that there was um, COVID disruptions over the past six months and we also had supply chain constraints. And finally, we've had the outbreak of war, which has effectively dominated the discussion. Now, if you look at the, the slide on, on in front of you, um, you can see the drivers of the returns in the broader indexes predominantly being energy and resources. Now, resources had been performing relatively well prior to the outbreak of the war anyway, but suddenly we've had a very, very big supply shock. And so even though the Montgomery Fund's response prior to the war was to invest in high quality businesses where we felt there was pricing power to offset the effects of inflation, we've seen you know, a, a much bigger sort of a price gap over the past two weeks, which has, in the short run, you know, impacted the valuations of our equities, as a lot of these investors are chasing, you know, shorter-term earnings certainty due to the commodity price spike. Okay, Joe. So, just on that theme of inflation, and you talked about the types of businesses that are able to offer some insulation against uh, potential you know, rising prices, uh, input costs. Can you name a couple of companies in the portfolio that uh, sort of show that resiliency and how that plays out? Mm. So I think the, the best example there, Scott, is uh, Reliance Worldwide. Now, the stock has um, declined quite a bit since the highs of November last year, and there are, there are real concerns around what the copper price um, and the higher input um, costs will do to their margins going forward. Now, the result itself was actually um, 
of pretty good quality. We've saw you know, top line growth partially as a result of volume growth, partially as a result of price increases. The, the offset to, we did see margins come down, but there's always a lag associated with you know, passing on some of these cost increases, and we saw that as a feature result. Now, that was expected. I think there are some more concerns given what we've seen today, you know, how they're going to be able to offset some of this, but you know, we're very confident based on our channel checks of the major retailers that they should be able to pass them on. You know, we're not seeing any slowdown slow in volume, um, and yet the share price has pulled back about 30%, and we see that as a very interesting opportunity opportunity um, going forward. Joe, we've seen big price rises in the companies that offer uh, natural resources and energy in particular. Um, the Montgomery Fund has tended not to own these companies in the past. Uh, can you talk to me about whether we own any at the moment and or what it would take for the fund to potentially own these businesses in the portfolio? Scott, well, you're right um, in noting that the Montgomery Fund has a history of not owning the resources or the energy stocks um, as we perceive them to be of lower quality. There are a couple of reasons for this. The first one is the fact that you know the the commodity-like nature of their revenue stream. So there's more price volatility, there's more earnings volatility, but also the reinvestment, the return on investment that they get, and that's especially true for the oil companies. Now, when we look at resources companies, there are two considerations that we make. Um, the first one is stock specific, and the second one is more on the earnings front, the earnings considerations. And so I I'd point you to Capricorn, for example, where we saw a stock specific idea outside of you know, just the gold price where we felt like the market was severely underestimating the, the re-rating potential as the company came online and developed um, the Carlo Winder project and that's been a very good performer for us uh, and the fund. And then the second part of it is the earnings consideration. Now what I mean by that, if you look at the commodity prices in general over a longer term history, we look at the, the earnings profile, we look at the commodity price profile, and we believe that commodity prices are much closer to peak earnings than they are to trough earnings. And so you, you have seen valuation uh, multiples comp compress as a result of that, and so the valuation multiples look very undemanding. But we are very concerned that the, the earnings profile of these businesses are trading at elevated sort of, you know, above cycle um, earnings. And so that's why we, we have elected to not play in will not invest in this space at this point in time. Mm. Is it a fair observation that uh, in the you know, sort of last nine weeks or thereabouts, we've seen uh, investors around the world look to sell some of the earnings mm -hmm. of these high quality consistent earners mm -hmm. and chase the resource mm -hmm. and energy exposures for the sort of short term price increases that their underlying commodities are offering? Absolutely, Scott. And I think that's very important for the ASX benchmark where you know the BHP has increased has an, has had an increased weight of seven to eight percent to twelve percent as a result of the unification of the UK line. And so we've suddenly had a much bigger weighting in BHP. Um, during very uncertain times um, as a result of the war, the one thing that investors can you know have a bit more certainty over is you know commodity prices have spiked and so people have chased this increased earnings profile and earnings certainty. Um, we do believe that will normalise as you know as we get some sort of resolution, whether it's a protracted resolution, there are, you know, it's very difficult to tell, but we're obviously investing for a much more medium-term outlook, and we believe the earnings profile of the companies that we own, where we can see more sort of dependable growth uh, prospects, um, that's where we've chosen to um, to remain invested. Okay. Um, the performance of the Montgomery Fund during this recent market pullback mm. uh, seems to be a little bit different compared to other pullbacks when the equity market has fallen. Can you maybe take uh, everyone through the reasons as to mm -hmm. you know, why I guess the fund has actually underperformed in a down market mm -hmm. on this occasion? Mm -hmm. 
So there are two main reasons for that, Scott. The first one is um, the cash levels. Now, part of the reason why the Montgomery Fund performed uh, so strongly last year was that we had reduced our cash levels um, to be much more fully invested. Now, the investors would be aware that we benefited a lot on the upside, but as markets do weaken, um, it does mean that we're more exposed to those forces, and so we've, we've had a bigger draw uh, pullback on that. The second part of it is what we were speaking about just then, which is the resources part of it. And so with resources being almost 30% of the broader benchmark, we've seen a lot of money flow out of you know, some of the higher quality businesses in the benchmark to some of these resources companies. And you know, they are the perceived beneficiaries of an inflationary environment. But now that we've had the supply, sh supply shock, we've seen a lot of money flow f out of um, these quality businesses into, you know, especially with the benchmark aware portfolios, you know, some of these you know, lower quality uh, businesses like the BHP and the Woodsides of the world. Okay, thanks for that, Joe. Uh, why don't we take a breather now and we'll move into part two of the video series as I'm talking with Joe Kim, the portfolio manager of the Montgomery Fund, to look a little bit at uh, what changes we've made to the portfolio uh, over the past few months. Thank you.